Hey guys, sorry it's taken a while to get this posted up. I've been busy chasing leads with the U.S. missing persons. I won't waste a warning of your time. Here's the log. If you have any information, then please send it my way. Thanks for your help, guys. It means a lot. Left Right Game, Draft 1, 1202-2017. Silence used to be an absolute. That's something I definitely miss. Back in the real world, it would stand as self-evident that a group of people saying absolutely nothing, by definition, could not be saying any less. Maybe things are different on the road, maybe I just never encountered it before, but it's clear to me now that there are degrees beyond silence. A pervasive realm of deafening quiet which, following the loss of Eve and Apollo, our group has unreservably embraced. Constructed out of our collective trauma, cemented with a cruel mixture of grief, guilt, and harrowing self-doubt, it quickly becomes apparent that the silence is stronger than all of us. The challenge of breaking it remains unmet for the rest of the journey. We spent the next few hours burrowing through a featureless corridor of maze. The stalks rise far above the Wrangler, leaving only a thin strip of clear sky visible like a painted ceiling on a Renaissance church. I find myself glancing intermittently at the CB radio, half expecting, half hoping for Apollo's voice to crackle through the speakers, bringing words of comfort or a much needed attempt at levity. After I catch myself staring at the radio for the fifth time, I decide it might be best to get on with my work. I plug my headphones into my notebook, bring up the audio files I've recorded thus far, and set about creating a very rough cut of our first day on the road. Everybody knows Rob. Rob's the guy. <laughs> I listen through Apollo's first interview, making notes for closing paragraphs, and I'll now be forced to write about him. When I have everything I need, I listen to the interview again, and then once more. It's not lost on me that I just want to hear his voice, to lose myself in a pleasant digital echo, far removed from the frantic screams that followed him into the asphalt. I listen to Eve's interview next. She bristles with excitement as she talks about her upcoming visit to Roswell, steadfastly attempting to recruit me to the effort. She had no idea what she was heading into when she stepped out onto Rob's front lawn. The thin strip of sky is turning deep orange as I reach her encounter with the hitchhiker. It's chilling to hear his voice after the fact, to revisit the conniving, veiled pleasantries he employed against us. I cringe as I hear Rob's hand grasp my arm. Ashamed that I let myself fall for the hitcher's trickery. You did good. I'm sorry for grabbing you. I just didn't want you to do something you'd regret. No, it's it's fine. I was going to... Yeah. Do you know what happens if you talk to him? Not sure. Came close myself once, a few years back. The way he looks at you and he thinks... I certainly didn't notice that at the time... I'd been so shaken by the run-in with the hitcher and so curious about the abandoned car that I'd been completely blind to anything else that had come my way. Maybe Rob misspoke. Maybe he meant to say weeks or months, but it wasn't a mistake. If it was a truth carelessly uttered, then Rob has some explaining to do. The left-right game was posted online in June 2016. I glanced sideways at him, a wall of corn rushing past us as we approached the rest stop. Throughout this trip, every emotion Rob's displayed has seemed genuine. The sadness, the anger, the concern, they tell a story of a man who cares deeply about the welfare of those around him. Yet at the same time, it's strikingly clear that there's something he isn't telling me. With every new piece of the puzzle, the car, the text message, the faceless creature with the ringing phone, I'm left with the dilemma of when to confront Robert Guthard with what I know. I feel I've gathered enough to bring before him, enough to demand an explanation, but there's no way I'd be able to truly verify his answer. I have a collection of strange, perplexing notions, lacking in the common thread that could bring me to any workable conclusion. If I'm going to confront Rob, I need to uncover that thread. Much like the greatest journalist of our time, I should know the answer before I ask the question. The jeep pulls up onto a large green space, staring straight ahead. I find myself puzzled by the way the ground seems to stop, as if the horizon lies only 20 meters away from the car. As soon as the engine cuts out, I unbuckle the seatbelt, climb out and walk toward the grassy verge. The rest of the convoy pulls up behind me as I go. 
I stop a few steps short of the edge, realizing we found our way to the top of a sheer cliff. A sudden swaying vertigo takes over, forcing me to take a few steps back. It doesn't feel like we've been heading uphill. The road has been level since jubilation, yet somehow I'm standing at the edge of a 400-foot rock face descending straight downwards. The distant earth shrouded by stalks of corn. That's the truly strange thing about this monophobic precipice. On the other side of me, the maze runs to the very edge of the cliff and at its base. The needless harvest continues until it stretches beyond the darkening horizon in every direction. It feels like I'm standing on the cliffs of Dover, staring out over a golden ocean, its waves governed by the evening breeze. I wonder for a moment where it ends. Then, taking consideration of the world I now occupy, I start to wonder if it ever does. A belligerent scream rips me from the view. The source of the noise is blocked by the Wrangler, and the first thing I see as I circle around are the shocked, wide-eyed faces of Bonnie and Clyde. Once I make my way past the Wrangler's hood, my expression mimics theirs. Lilith has pinned Blue Jay up against the side of the jeep, a locked forearm pressing her chest against the door. Her other arm has been grasped by Blue Jay's hand, desperately stopped before it can strike her across the face. The two of them yell through gritted teeth as Lilith struggles furiously against her. Get the fuck off me, you bitch! Get off! I take a few quick steps over to Lilith as Blue Jay attempts to kick her away. Lilith, we can't do this. Jen. <laughs> Lilith doesn't even register my presence as she continues her assault, deafened by the bubbling vitriol and every growling breath. Jen, we are not doing this. Not after... Before I can comprehend what's happening, I'm staring at the sky, my head knocked back by the force of Lilith's flailing elbow. A hot, raw ache radiates across my lower lip as I stagger back, raising my hand over my mouth. Before Lilith can continue her assault, Rob swings open his door and takes two short strides over to her. He puts one arm around the girl's waist and picks her up, carrying her safely but firmly over to Bonnie and Clyde's Ford and planting her back on the ground. I seem to always forget how strong he is. Damn it, this is not the time. Take it back! Blue Jay has lost her usual snide demeanor, yet her aura still radiates in unbridled scorn. In response to Lilith's demand, Blue Jay walks back to her car and sits on the hood. She takes the Marlboros out of her pocket along with her lighter and ignites a cigarette. I imagine the burning embers are the only company she's comfortable to accept right now. By the time I look back to the rest of the group, Lilith has stormed away. What did she say? I didn't hear it all. What did she say, Bonnie? I heard something about... She said Lilith was... That we were complicit. God damn it. Bristol, can you... I watch Lilith as she sits on the grass and looks over the cliffside. She begins to cry, yet I get a strong notion that it's not something I should interrupt. It feels like something between her and Eve, a final act of reactionary mourning reserved for them and them alone. Yeah, don't worry, I'll handle it. Okay, I'll cook us up something. An hour passes. Lilith grows slowly calmer, drifting from cathartic release into a cold, wordless melancholy. Finishing up my dinner, I make my way over to her. It's a strange view. Lilith looks up at me. Her face falls. I cut you. I'm so sorry. It's fine. You should see the other girl. <laughs> yeah. I bet she looks like shit right about now. I help myself down onto the cool ground, staring alongside Lilith into the ocean below. Blue Jay thinks I'm complicit in what happened to Eve. I heard. She used to think we were morons. Now she thinks we're all in on it. Doesn't make sense. I think she has to believe this place is a lie. She needs it to make sense. And the harder it gets for her to rationalize, the more she... Anyway, she shouldn't have said what she said. She's just... I guess the word is troubled. She's a fucking thunder cunt. Um, uh, okay. She's right, though. I killed her. And I killed Apollo, too. I took to Lilith, concerned, not quite sure what she means. Her eyes remain locked on the impossible horizon. Sarah, she wasn't cut out for this, and she knew it. She wanted us to turn back this morning, but I didn't want to. That wasn't just your decision, Lilith. Yes, it was. She, uh, she followed my lead, always, through everything. And I knew why she was doing it. I knew. But I let it continue because it was convenient. Because
because it was easy. Because deep down, I liked having someone around who, who jumped through fucking hoops for me. God, it's so fucked. Lilith rests her head on her hands. She was weak. She was anxious and shy and... But that should be okay, right? You're allowed to be weak, that's... But I made her come here. I dragged someone who couldn't swim into the fucking deep end. And the last thing I did was lie to her. And she fucking knew it. What do you mean? I didn't. I... I loved her, you know, as a... As a friend. It was always this fucking one-way street, and... I don't think she minded, but... Then suddenly she's vanishing right in fucking front of me, and she said what she said. I mean, how else was I supposed to respond to that? I had to say it back, right? I could see it in her eyes that she didn't believe me. Fuck. I wonder how many people have died while being told, like... Comforting lies. How many of them fucking knew? I think you did the best you could, Jen. I think you did better than most. You don't need to tell me that, just... Are you tired? Do you need to go to bed soon? I don't need to. There are some beers in a... in an Apollo's bag. Is that, like, looting? Or is that okay? I think you'd want us to have them. As long as he got a toast. Lilith laughs briefly and finally smiles. She walks over to Bonnie and Clyde's car, returning a moment later with a four-pack. We spent the next hour and a half slowly drinking them. Lilith can't muster the right words for a toast, so we just say thank you to Apollo, raising our cans in the open air. We talk about his tireless humor, his attempts to keep us all up during our first night on the road, how caringly he spoke to everyone, even at the edge of death. We talk about Eve, about the pair's misadventures, award college parties, and the future of Paranomicon. Lilith smiles and tells me there's always a place for me once radio dies out. After everything that's happened on the road, the night can't help but feel bittersweet. But for once, on a solitary cliffside in the middle of nowhere, it's more sweet than it is bitter. That may not be much, but at the end of an awful day, it's more than either of us could have hoped for. The next morning goes quickly. It's amazing how efficient a group of people can be when none of them feel like talking. Not only that, but breakfast has become a noticeably brief affair. I managed to get through half a bag of trail mix before I find myself uncomfortably full. Rob's words about the road's sustaining properties ring in my ears as I look around the group. Everyone leaves their bowls half empty. Willith hasn't eaten a bite. By this point, the launch protocol has been drilled into us. Despite our precautions and the fractious rifts developing between us, the cars line up like clockwork as they merge onto the road. In fact, the mood of the group seems strangely procedural. All radio contact starts with the stating of a call sign, followed by that of a recipient. The cars maintain an even, careful distance between one another. We've seen all too clearly what happens when the rules are neglected, and no one wants to take chances anymore. How far are we? From where? You haven't gone to the end of this road, right? I mean, you're still charting it. That's right. Well, how long until we get to, you know, to uncharted territory? To be honest, not too long. What's going to happen once we reach that point? We're going to keep driving. Until we get to the end? That's the plan. You know, I won't judge you if you want to turn around. I'm sure you can talk someone into it. Can I talk you into it? Rob smiles. Afraid not. This trip ain't like the others. Road's kicking back like never before. I think it knows I'm coming all the way this time. What is this place, Rob? Rob sighs as he slowly takes the next left on a quiet, rural T-junction. I think it's a stray thread running off of the spool. The radio cracks. Rob, you just took the wrong turn. An instant drum of fresh panic hammers in my chest. I stare at Rob. He stares right back. I know he's feeling the same thing I am, though he's doing a much better job of keeping it off his face. He thinks carefully for a minute. 
No, no. I've been down this road before. We took a right last time. Uh, yeah, yes. The turn right before this one was right, I remember. Yeah. Oh. Ferryman to all cars. Thanks, Bonnie, for giving us the fright of our lives. We were on the right. We're on the correct road. No, no, that can't be it. it that's wrong. Martin, tell him. Our mistake, Rob. Let's keep going. Bristol? There's concern in Wolf's voice. I lean over to my wing mirror, attempting to gauge the atmosphere in the car behind me. There's clearly some commotion between Bonnie and Clyde, with the latter attempting to gently remove the walkie-talkie from his sister's hands. There's something else, however, past Bonnie and Clyde, past Blue Jay. An old dilapidated road sign made of weathered timber stands by the side of the road behind us. I can't read all of it as its peeling letters grow ever smaller, but I can piece together what it probably once said. Wintry Bay, five miles. We're going to turn around, right? Yeah, one sec, Ronnie. I'll check the map. I promptly switch off the radio. Are we not passing through Wintry Bay? Rob turns to me, a puzzled look in his eyes. Through where? In the wake of those two innocently inquiring words, my mind reels back to the morning of our third day on the road, watching Bonnie and Clyde wander over to Rob and confess their transgressions with the hitchhiker. The quiet conversation that passed between them, Rob's seemingly comforting response. I felt wretched in those moments. A few minutes prior, I had tricked and deceived Clyde. Yet, I never once considered he might have done the same to me. Is it safe to pull over? What? Why? Is it safe, Rob? Uh, yeah, it should be. Then pull over. I switch the radio back on and grab the receiver. As I make a connection to Bonnie and Clyde's car, it's clear that an argument is brewing. Lilith is asking for me, a helpless passenger caught in the middle of something she doesn't understand. Bristle to all cars. We're stopping up ahead. Rob seems acutely aware that I'm not messing around. I throw my door open and jump onto the dusty roadside, striding over to the rest of the convoy who are just starting to get out of their own cars. I'm conscious of the driving anger behind each step I take. You didn't tell him? Bristol, I... What's going on, Bristol? Rob marches up behind me, more than a little restless to get a grip on my motives. Clyde? Clyde looks around a circle of expectant eyes when he delivers his answer. He is unable to meet any of them. Bonnie? Bonnie, talk to the hitchhiker. Rob's expression shifts, his confusion degrading into a solemn understanding. God, God damn it. You knew about this, Bristol? I told them to tell you the morning of the third day. I, I, I saw them go over to you. I, I thought they did. Bonnie thought you'd turn us around. Well, she was damn right. You seen what happens when the rules get broken. You should have told me as soon as you saw me and headed right back home. That was before Ace, before everything. I, I didn't know what this place was. The rules are the rules, Clyde. Is anything even wrong with Bonnie? You said she gets confused. Was that a lie? Clyde doesn't answer, avoiding Rob's glare. As I process what Rob's just said, I have to say I'm surprised by the deviousness of the two siblings. When I thought they were telling Rob about the hitchhiker, it appears they'd instead told that Bonnie was, to some degree, senile. It was a simple lie, but one that would adequately explain her odd behavior, draw sympathy from Rob, and most ingeniously, prevent him from telling me about their conversation. A truth buried beneath an unpleasant lie, its subject matter just uncomfortable enough to head off any chance of discussion. Still, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. We can head home if you want. No! She speaks in a tone more decisive than I thought her capable. Pete, you've been talking about it a lot, Bonnie. Rob stares at them both. His position has been made crystal clear. We're stopping a little early today. Come the rest of the way with us. Rest up, and tomorrow you both go home. You should count yourselves lucky and you get the chance to turn around, signaling that the discussion is over. Lilith, you're with us. Lilith doesn't even try to hide her relief as she shuffles away from Bonnie and Clyde and climbs into the back of the jeep. It's a little heartwarming that Rob still has the awareness to look out for her, angry as he may be. As well as his surprising strength, I also tend to forget how perceptive he can be. Bonnie, Clyde, and Blue Jay climb back into their respective vehicles. I catch Bonnie's eye. The moment before she returns to the Ford, she appears truly disappointed, but otherwise resigned to keep going, satisfied to let the wintry bay fade into the distance. It's comforting to hear that she's ready to put the place behind her. It's just a pity I don't believe a word of it.
It was fucking weird, Bristol. Lilith seems happy to be in the Wrangler, enjoying the sense of security the modest behemoth affords, and also greatly relieved to be away from Bonnie and Clyde. She spent the last five minutes detailing the thirty-second argument that unfolded between them, charting its disturbing nuances as well as its eerie conclusion. But I swear she was basically like crying, like she didn't understand how we could be going the wrong way. But then like as soon as you pulled us over, she just stopped. Like. I mean, stopped. That must have been disconcerting. You have no idea. So, Rob, when are these cornfields gonna fucking end? Soon. We're gonna rest up for the night in a few turns. And tomorrow, it won't be long until we're on the track through the woods. The fucking woods? Are you kidding? Are we talking, like, sleepy, hollow, bleeding trees, or what? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. I ain't been that far yet. It's new territory. Lilith goes quiet, transfixed by something in the rearview mirror, before quickly turning around to get a better look at the back window. The car behind us is out of control. Bonnie is fighting to wrest the steering wheel from her brother. The Ford swerves erratically behind us, driven mad by the dynamic power struggle taking place inside it. Rob sharply accelerates out of the way as the car behind lurches drunkenly to and fro before skidding to a shuddering halt. Rob hits the brake hard, and by the time I've turned in his direction, he had already slammed the door of the Wrangler, storming across the tarmac to Bonnie and Clyde. Cut the engine! The Ford's engine goes silent, and in the absence of the rumbling growl, new sounds emerge. The sound of struggle and a wild, desperate screaming. Stepping out of the car for the second time today, I jumped out into the road and covered the distance between us. Rob is attempting to pull a screaming Bonnie from the car. Even with his impressive strength, it seems to be a challenge. Bonnie claws at the walls, trying with all her might to regain her grasp on the steering wheel. Please, please let me go, let me go! Rob extracts Bonnie from the car and attempts to subdue her amidst a flurry of flailing hands and elbows. She writhes and kicks as he pins her arms to her sides. Bonnie, Bonnie, calm down, okay? Let's, let's talk through this. He told me it's on our way. He said we'd pass through it. He lied, Bonnie. No, we're going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way. Bonnie lashes out again, striking at Rob's legs with her own. Rob holds her firmly, his teeth gritted through every impact. It's clear that Bonnie isn't going to let up. They run back to the Wrangler and open up the trunk. After a few minutes of rummaging through my bag, I find the first aid kit and pull out an unopened pack of zip ties. Clyde, open the back door. Rob sees me standing with the zip ties. Even in the midst of Bonnie's incessant struggle, he looks at me with an almost questioning air, as if he's wondering how we ever arrived at this point. As if... He's asking whether we can really do what I'm wordlessly suggesting. Bonnie answers the last question for me. In a slim few seconds of distraction, she slams her head back into his nose, eliciting a disgustingly loud thud and a pained growl from Rob. Dazed and confused, his nose immediately fountaining blood. Rob manages to keep his arm wrapped around her, but it's clear that this isn't going to be sustainable and that she isn't anywhere close to calming down. Clyde has opened the door, stepping back and looking on like a frightened child as we carry Bonnie over to the back seat of the Ford. I lean in before him, adjusting the headset until it's pressed against the ceiling, ensuring that it can't be removed from the bracket. I then loop a zip tie around each bracket and fasten them. What the fuck is going on? Blue Jay has stepped out of her car, making her way towards us, and I realize that to someone who is fighting to not believe any of this, the following scene would appear at best as a melodramatic farce, and at worst as the attempted detention of an innocent and distressed woman. Sadly, I don't have time to field her questions. I climb into the car, Bonnie working constantly against us as Rob eases her in after me, his hand on her head to prevent it from bumping the top of the doorframe. Once she's inside, I loop a second zip tie around the one I've already fastened on the right bracket, forcing her right hand inside it. I pull the plastic tab over the sleeve of her jumper. I hope it's not too tight, but at the very least, it's secure enough to keep her in place. Bonnie continues to pull against the zip ties, but it's clear her strength has been sapped from her spirited battle with Rob. Not quite able to look her in the eye, I push a pile of luggage out of the way and climb out the other side of the Ford. Rob and I are both getting our breath back, the former pinching his nose and adjusting stoically to the fresh pain. What the fuck are you... You're not going to leave her like that, are you? Get back in your car, Blue Jay. I walk back to the Wrangler, tuning out Denise's coarse protests. Rob reaches into the Jeep, still open trunk, and pulls out a pile of blankets and pillows. In the rearview mirror, I can see him placing them on Bonnie's lap, giving her a place to rest her elbows. She leans forward against the back of the headrest, 
Even with her face blocked from the view, I can tell she's crying. We arrive at the rest stop some twenty minutes later, the vague outline of a deep green forest blooming on the horizon. It's earlier in the day than we usually stop. Rob tells us he wants the entirety of tomorrow to chart the woods, as well as a good time to turn back before nightfall should the need arise. I'm not complaining. I'm glad of the chance to rest up following today's events. For the rest of the day, we take it in turns to keep an eye on Bonnie, making sure she has everything she needs. When the Ford pulled up alongside us, Lilith, Rob, and I expected to see a quivering wreck tugging ceaselessly against her bonds. We were all surprised and a little more disturbed to find her smiling. By the time my turn comes around, the sun is already dipping in the sky. Rob has prepared a small pot of miso soup in case anyone can bring themselves to eat. I finish my bowl, all too aware of how unnecessary each meal now feels, and pour out a helping for Bonnie, and I find her in good spirits. How are you doing, Alice? I'm fine. How are you doing, Linda? I'm okay. Sorry for giving you such a fright earlier. I feel terrible. It's fine, honestly. I'm, I'm sorry about, about all this. I gesture to the zip tie restraints, fastening bandages underneath the straps to afford Bonnie a modicum of comfort. Still, the scene rings with a sinister barbarity which no consideration can make up for. It's okay. It's okay. I wasn't myself. I brought you some soup. I know you might not be hungry. No, no, I'd love some. Thank you. Everyone's being so lovely. Well, we just want to make sure you're all right. I submerge the spoon, drench up a measure of warm broth, and begin to raise it towards her. No, you don't have to. I can feed myself. She gestures to her bound hands, the implication hanging in the air. No, I... I don't mind. I think it's... Bonnie throws her weight sideways, her elbow jabbing outwards and hitting the bowl out of my hand. Soup spills over my fleece, just a little cooler than scalding hot, and soaks immediately into the fabric. I back away reflexively and watch Bonnie's expression flicker like a faulty light bulb from a kind tranquility to utter, burning contempt. It's gone as quickly as it appears, just in time for the rest of the group to look our way. What are you doing with her? Blue Jay storms across from her car angrily drawing Marlboro and forcing the smoke draconally back in the air. Nothing, just an accident. It's okay, Blue Jay, <laughs> it was my mistake. Did she get any on you? Blue Jay leans in, placing her hand comfortably on Bonnie's, before turning to fix me with a murderous stare. It's almost impressive how, even when caring for someone, Blue Jay still manages to be simultaneously venomous to those around her. No, no, it's okay, it was my fault. It, I'm fine. I'm sorry for causing trouble. Blue Jay laughs at Bonnie's submissive apology, unable to believe what she's thinking. Her eyes remain fixed on me. You're a fucking coward. Look what he's making you do. Look. My eyes follow where she gestures. I have to admit, the helpless figure of Bonnie, restrained in the backseat of a Ford, rings with an innate inhumanity, and being forced to stare my actions in the face makes me feel utterly ghoulish. The choices I've made must seem insane to Blue Jay, but that doesn't mean hers are not. Despite her pretensions of rationality, I can't help but feel that Blue Jay's actions are simply being governed by a different insanity. An insanity born out of a desperate need to explain the unexplainable, which has morphed into an ugly cocktail of paranoia, self-grandeur, and a fervent antagonism. Blue Jay notes my silent expression, most likely taking it as a personal victory. Without another word, she turns to her car and shuts herself inside, festering silently and alone. Do you want to know what's wonderful, Alice? Bonnie leans towards me, lowering her voice so no one else can hear. He told me there's a house waiting for me, my home by the sea. I I'm sorry, Bonnie, I, I don't think there. It's going to be such a beautiful place, such a beautiful place. Bonnie flashes me a broad grin. It's been lovely knowing you, Alice. Bonnie turns away from me, placing her forehead back on the headrest. The grin doesn't fade as I turn away. I walk back to the Wrangler, faced with the choice of changing into new clothes or my thermal pajamas. After removing my fleece and lying down for just a moment, I end up sleeping in the clothes I'm wearing. When I wake up, the Wrangler is moving. The air mattress reverberates and my body rocks as we make a sharp U-turn. I sit bolt upright. Lilith waking up next to me, similarly blurry-eyed and confused. Rob is behind the wheel. The gear stick shakes as he transports us down the road at incredible speed. 
Rob, what's happening? Bonnie got herself free. She's headed for the turn. I pull myself in the passenger seat, suddenly wide awake. Is she with Clyde? She hit him over the head, dragged him out of the car. I couldn't wait for him, but he's catching up. Both and I turn around. Blue Jay's car is gaining on us, a distant pair of high beams steadily drowning the rear window in light. Why is Blue Jay helping him? She probably wants to keep an eye on us. Rob, do you think we'll catch up with Bonnie? I'm working on it. The Wrangler continues to rocket through the darkness. We keep our eyes fixed forward, scanning the very edge of the horizon for any sign of Bonnie's Ford. When Blue Jay pulls up alongside us, I get a look at the pair. Blue Jay is not, but steely determination dedicated to reaching Bonnie before we do. Clyde looks mortified, rocked by her sister's actions, a small contusion on her head to mark her vicious betrayal. Rob screeches to a halt once we arrive at the junction. Blue Jay's headlights are already illuminating the road to Wintry Bay. The road's lighting rig coats the entire area in an artificial twilight. In the middle of all of it, we see Bonnie, standing next to the car, smiling. She's already beyond the threshold of the turn. Linda, Linda, Please, come on back now, okay? You can all come with me. There's a place for all of us, he told me. There's a place for everyone. Please, Linda, you have to come back. A strange trail of black dust is streaming off Bonnie's skin, rising into the air and dancing in the breeze. After a moment, it becomes clear that the edges of Bonnie are slowly degrading, converting quickly into dark ash and drifting into the atmosphere. I love you very, very much, Martin. You're always welcome. No, please, please. Bonnie turns around and climbs into the car. Without looking back, she pulls away down the road to Wintry Bay. The trail of black particles rise from the Ford as she goes, with greater and greater volume as the entire car starts to wither away before her eyes. Less than a minute later, the Ford, with Bonnie inside it, gradually dissolves into dust and scatters to the winds. Clyde doesn't speak. His entire being is quiet. Lilith immediately runs back to the Wrangler. Rob waits a while, staring at the dancing clouds of dust, before putting his arm around Clyde and gently escorting him to the jeep. As I turn away from the road to Wintry Bay, I take note of Blue Jay's reaction. She looks absolutely petrified, more so than I've ever seen her. She impulsively removes the pack of Marlboros from her pocket and holds them in her hand, before quickly returning them, unsmoked. The night passes slowly after we return to the rest stop. All of us are exhausted and more than willing to surrender to the escapism of sleep. Rob rests in the driver's seat, giving up his space on the air mattress to Clyde. Everyone drops quickly enough into their quiet slumber, leaving me awake with only my thoughts for company. I find myself thinking of Blue Jay and how she could possibly hope to rationalize the disintegration of Bonnie and her car. I wonder how I'd feel if the left's right game were exposed as some unparalleled magic trick. Would I feel foolish? No, I don't think so. Impressed, maybe? Relieved? Most definitely. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I miss the innocent days when I believed the game was a hoax. I suppose I see why Blue Jay was so adamant about dismissing this place. Trickery, however elaborate, is almost always a preferable alternative to genuine horror. The jeep doors open and shut. Part of me tries to ignore it to wash my hands of any other developments of this harrowing night. However, exiled as I am from the kingdom of sleep, I slowly find myself sitting up, quietly putting on my boots and letting myself out. I step out into the cold night, observing the figure before me. Where are you going, Clyde? Clyde turns to face me. I initially interpret the look he gives me as one of resignation, but the word doesn't quite fit. Resignation is a defeat. The world exacting compliance from you against your own wishes. The man before me is as calm as the night air around him. His wishes are clearly his own. There is no defeat in his eyes, but something else entirely. Peace, maybe. You know where I'm going, Alice. Clyde speaks softly, a quiet conviction behind every word he says. I briefly glance towards the Wrangler, wondering if I'm really equipped to handle this on my own. Don't call Rob. I made a mistake coming back to the rest stop. I shouldn't have done. Please, just let me go. Clyde, just wait for tomorrow, okay? He'll understand. He'll turn us around and take you home. It won't be home anymore. Clyde's gentle stare renders me silent. 
Linda had a husband once. He was a good man. He died young. She could never bring herself to go looking again. I never found who I was looking for. We've been by each other's side for 60 years. 60 years. We gotta be honest. Even after all we've been through and everything you and I have seen, I never felt like I was in a new world until now. I don't think I can let you do this, Clyde. I'm sorry, Alice. It's not up to you. Clyde breathes in the cold night air, exhaling through his nose. I yelled at her to come back when she ran off to rob the ice cream parlor. I kept calling out and calling out. I spent so much energy trying to get her to come back to me. After a while, I realized she wasn't coming back, but that I'd have to follow her. I should have realized it earlier. That's all I can do. Follow her where she goes. Clyde looks at me, almost apologetically. Goodbye, Alice. He turns away from the convoy and wanders back down the road. Clyde! He turns around one last time. Do you want company? It takes roughly an hour for us to walk back to the junction. In the time we have, I'm treated to the story of Bonnie and Clyde. The warmest fragments of their life together, the moments that built them, the waves that rocked them, the places they once called home. I don't think I'll ever agree with what Clyde is doing, but the more he talks, the more I understand. His stories span more than half a century, supported by a transient cast of acquaintances and friends, but at the core of each tale is a pair of siblings who meant the world to one another. The pair existed as two relative souls, quantifiable only in relation to each other. In the absence of one, the remnant was indefinable. A drifting point, unanchored in space. The story ends just as we reach the junction. I hope she's out there. I hope so too. Thank you for coming with me. I know it's late. No, it's, it's never a bad time to see a friend off. Clyde smiles at me one last time before turning to face the road, past the old wooden sign. In the silence of the night, I hear nothing but his soft footsteps in the quiet breeze, which, after a few minutes, carries the last of him into the open sky. It's a long walk back to the convoy. My mind is numb to fear as I make my way through the dark, the corn rustling in the wind beside me. It's been four days since I arrived at Rob Guthard's house, sat down at his table and listened to him speak about the new world he'd discovered. In that time, I've seen things I can't hope to comprehend, signs that exist beyond the spectrum of our reality, things I wouldn't have deemed possible. For all I know, there is a wintry bay, and Bonnie has already arrived at her house by the sea, standing at the door, waiting with a quiet confidence for her brother's arrival. I may never know, but I do hope they find each other, wherever they are.